Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I'd like to welcome everyone to Antioch Baptist Church Sunday service, the last Sunday in January. We thank God for you all tuning in via YouTube, Facebook, Zoom, your phone, any technical device that you're using. We thank you for tuning in. God bless you and may heaven continue to smile upon you. Welcome. Let us pray. Eternal God, we come this morning, Father, first of all, most of all, just to say thank you. Thank you for watching over all of us last night, Father. We just bless your name and lift your name on high. Lord, we thank you in spite of what's going on in this world today with COVID-19 and all the sicknesses and all the things that's going on. Lord, we lift your name up on high. Father, I pray right now for everyone that's zoomed in for Antioch Baptist Church this morning for the service. Lord, lift them up, strengthen them, cover them, that they may know that you are there, which you are there and you are always there. You're the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Lord, we bless your name. We lift your name on high. Give us strength today, Lord, to go forth. Remove me that you may get the glory, eternal God. We thank you and we bless you and we lift your name on high. Amen.
Our scripture today is found in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, and I'll be reading from the NIV. Put on, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, inward parts of compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, bearing one another and forgiving one another. If anyone should have a complaint against anyone, even as the Lord forgave you, so also should you forgive. And over all these things put on love, which is the uniting bond of perfectness.
I'd like to tag this subject today. Forgiveness is mandatory. Forgiveness is mandatory. How does a person who have been hurt let go and let God? You know you should let it go, but you hold on to the hurt as tenaciously as a dog holds on to a piece of steak. There's only one way to get past your hurt and pain. The only antidote for those hurts is forgiveness. Paul gives some sayings in Colossians 3, 12 and 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Peter came to Jesus and asked him, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Forgiveness is rarely a one-time event, saints. So often do you have to keep releasing your right to get even. Until you stop feeling the hurt, then you'll know you've forgiven that person. Amen? What is forgiveness? What is forgiveness? The Bible's answer, forgiveness is the act of pardoning an offender. In the Bible, the Greek word translated forgiveness literally means to let go. As a, when a person does not demand payment for a debt. Jesus used this comparison when he taught his followers to pray. Forgive our sins for ourselves. Also, forgive everyone who is in debt to us. Likewise, in his parable of the unmerciful slave, Jesus equated forgiveness with canceling a debt. We forgive others when we let go of resentment and give up any claim to be compensated for the hurt or loss we have suffered. The Bible teaches that unselfish love, saints, is the basis for true forgiveness. Since love does not keep account of the injury at all. What forgiveness does not mean? Condoning the offense. The Bible actually condemns those who claim that bad actions are harmless or acceptable. Pardoning that the offense never happened. God forgave King David of serious sins, but he did not shield David from the consequences of his actions. God even had David's sins recorded so that they are remembered today in 2 Samuel 12, 9 through 13. Saints, the action of number 45 has consequences. The actions of the people coming into the Capitol House has consequences. Allowing others to take advantage of you. Suppose, for example, that you loan someone some money, but he wastes it and then cannot repay you, and he has promised he will pay you. He is very sorry and apologizes to you. You could choose to forgive him by not harboring a resentment, not rehashing the matter, within continually or perhaps even canceling the debt altogether. However, you might also choose not to loan him any more money. <laughs> what if you are the victim of a cruel mistreatment by someone who refuses to apologize or admit to what he has done? The Bible says, let go of anger and abandoning rage while not excusing the error you can refuse to be consumed with anger. Trust that God will bring that person into account. You can also take comfort in knowing that God will bring a time when we will no longer feel the deep pain or hurt that may harden or burden on us. Forgiving every perceived slight. Sometimes, rather than pardoning a so-called offender, we may need to admit that we had no valid 
cause for being offended in the first place. The Bible says, do not be quick to take offense, for the taking of offense is a mark of a fool. Ecclesiastics 7 and 9. How to forgive someone. Remember what forgiveness involves. You are not condoning the wrong or acting as if it never happened. You are simply letting it go. Recognize the benefits of forgiving. Letting go of the anger and resentment can help you to keep calm, improve your health, and increase your happiness. Even more important, forgiving others is a key to receiving God's forgiveness for your own sins. Be empathetic. All of us are imperfect. All of us are imperfect. Just as we appreciate being forgiven, we should likewise forgive the mistakes of others. Be reasonable. When we have a minor cause for complaint, we can apply the Bible's counsel. Continue putting up with one another, Antioch. Act quickly. Work to forgive as soon as you can rather than letting your anger fester. Have any of you ever been wronged or hurt by someone? If you have, you know firsthand how easy it would be to stay angry and to grow bitter to a person. God definitely understands what it is like to be hurt and wrong. We, through our sins, we commit on a daily basis hurt and wrong God. I believe that there are many Christians who are, for some reason, refuse to let go of grudges that they may have against other persons. Throughout the course of your life, you can expect to be wronged from time to time by others. You may even feel strongly that whatever another did was wrong. We, though, cannot hold on to that anger, bitterness, but we must forgive. Whenever we sin and mess up and then come to God in sincere repentance, we expect God to forgive us, don't we? It is often different for us, though, when we are wronged. We often have a hard time letting go and forgiving. Hmm. The easy thing to do is to stay angry. It takes much more effort and much more trouble to forgive and let go of something. I would assume that this morning, Many of us are holding on to some anger and bitterness towards someone that we should let go of. Hmm. It is inevitable, saints, that all of us, all of us has been wronged at some point in the time of our lives that we do not really have a choice in. We do, however, have a choice in the time of our lives on how we react to the wrong that has been done to us. We can either choose bitterness or forgiveness. But I'm here this morning to tell you, I don't want to stay bitter, but I want to get better. I want to be better and not bitter. There are many misconceptions about the biblical forgiveness. Really, it is. Many people's ideas of forgiveness have been shaped by the world and not by the word. Therefore, there is a grave danger, saints, for many Christians are unfairly holding onto anger that they should have let go of. How about this one? I've said it. I will forgive, but I will not forget. I will forgive, but I will not forget. This is the worst misconception that I hear people say more than any other. Many people say they will forgive, but they make sure that the people know that they will never, ever forget. We are told to forgive saints as we want to be forgiven. And the scriptures tell us that not only does God remove our sins, but also he forgets them and he remembers them no more. Hmm. How would you like God to tell us upon our repentance that he will forgive but not forget? I understand that we are human and we cannot help but to remember certain things and it is not easy to put events out of our minds. Hmm. But we must do our best to treat people we say we forgive as if the wrong never happened. For that is exactly what God does with us. You see, for goodness sakes, when you forgive somebody, forgive them. Let it go. After you tell someone you forgive them and you do not let it go, your anger and bitterness 
You are the one sinning now, even if they were initially wronging you. Many people forgive, but they never forget or let the offender forget what they had done. That is not biblical forgiveness, saints. Biblical forgiveness keeps no records of wrongs and does not hold a person's sins over their head. How about this one? I have a right to be mad. I've said it, you said it, I have a right to be mad. Many people think that they have the right to be mad and stay mad. I have especially heard this when someone really feels that they have been greatly wronged. There may be no doubt that what someone did may have hurt and been wrong, but to believe that you have the right to be mad and stay mad is a lie from the devil. If we are to forgive as we want to be forgiven, we do not have the right to remain mad no matter what someone has done to us. I am suggesting this morning, saints, that it is always easy to let go and forgive people that have really caused you pain. But the scripture make one thing clear. That is, no matter what we do, we do not have the right to stay mad and hold a grudge. How about this one? Things will never be the same. I've heard other people say, I will forgive, but things will never be the same. There is a problem with that. The purpose of forgiving is not just overlooking someone's fault, but it is restoring a relationship back to the way it was before the wrong took place. It is called reconciliation. Hmm. This is exactly what God does with us. Not only does he forgive us of our sins, but he restores our relationship to the way it was intended to be. As a matter of fact, after we wrong God, after we receive his forgiveness, we are placed in a better relationship than before. Can I get a witness? I am not saying, saints, that naturally some trust may have been lost. But if we are going to forgive, then we need to forgive. If a person comes to you and asks for forgiveness for what they have done, we have a duty to attempt to restore that relationship that may have been damaged the necessity of forgiveness. There is an absolute necessity to forgive one another because we have been forgiven. We have been forgiven. The parable that Jesus told was rich in its teaching. One servant Jesus told was brought before the king. This servant owed 10,000 talents. If this is referring to the Greek talent, the total would be somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to eight million dollars that the servant owed. The same servant hmm, pleaded to be given a chance to pay back the debt and the master forgave him of his great debt. That same servant then went out and saw one who owed him about a hundred denarii, which was only a total of less than twenty dollars. He had the man put in prison for the small debt that he owed. Then when the king learned of this, he was not happy because he expected that the servant should be willing to show mercy to someone else since he had shown mercy to him. The same should be said of us saints, shouldn't it? What right do we have to hold on to anger and to hold a grudge since we have been forgiven? We too should forgive others who wronged us because we have been commanded. Forgiveness is mandatory. It is certain that at some point, somewhere, someone, you will be hurt along the way. I know it may sound kind of silly, but we really do not have a choice in the matter. We are commanded to forgive, and therefore there is an absolute necessity, necessity, to forgive. As I have said before, it is inevitable that we will be wronged at some point in our life, but we do have a choice in how we respond. The same is true with the much of, us, of our attitude. See, it's not so much what needs to be changed in the world or you, but what needs to be changed in me and my attitude towards the world and toward you. There are many circumstances which cannot help or control, but we can choose our response and our attitude. How will you respond when someone wrongs you? 
There are several different options which many people choose. Some people choose to retaliate. These people feel that since they have been wrong, they should react and repay the person for their wrongs. They forget the common saying that two wrongs do not make a right. They forget the call from the word of God to not repay evil for evil, but to repay evil with good. They forget that vengeance is the Lord's. Obviously, this is not the right action and leads only to an escalation of problems, begins a, vice, a vicious cycle of wrongs that is not easy to stop. Some people, however, choose a, a harbor malice, hatred and anger in their hearts towards someone that has wronged them. Though they may not have retaliated, this response to a wrong may be more spiritually dangerous, saints, than any other. The longer you harbor bad feelings in your heart, the harder it is to remove them from your heart, and the more hard-hearted a person becomes. Other people respond by ignoring the wrong. Though this may not create the hardness of heart and bitter feelings, I do not believe that God expects us to be doormats or to simply ignore when someone wrongs us or sins against us. How about the great example of forgiveness? The great example of forgiveness. It is almost goes without saying that Jesus is the best example of forgiveness. He not only preached it, but he also lived it. Some of his last words before his death were, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In all things, Christ is the perfect example. The danger, saints, of unforgiving. Unforgiveness, unforgiveness is like drinking poison, but expecting the other person to die. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison, but expecting the other person to die. The first and most dangerous of unforgiveness is that if you do not forgive people who sinned against us, is that we ourselves would not be forgiven. Can I get a witness? In Colossians 3 and 12, contains the main command to clothe yourselves. The, com the command to clothe yourselves provides a powerful illustration of Christian sanctification. The paragraph describes specifically what the Colossians are to put on. The five accusative nouns Paul uses in 312 could best be summarized by the noun in 314, love, which is the one thing that binds the whole virtues together. The Colossians must close themselves with the robe of love which binds the other virtues, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience together. Paul says that love is the perfect bond of unity, the unity of God's new People that Paul described in 311 where racial, cultural, and sociological differences are transcendent. It's only possible in a community where love is the rule. In Colossians 3:14, Paul stresses the importance of love in the list of virtues by saying that the Colossians, Antiochians, should clothe themselves with love above all. In verse 312, also contains the motive for completing the command to clothe yourself. Paul says that the Colossians are God's chosen. Antioch is God's chosen, holy and dearly loved people. That is, their status as God's people should drive them towards the virtues associated with love. The Colossians, Antiochians, should have a solidarity not on the basis of common language, geography, or culture, but on the basis of their having been chosen by God as his holy and beloved people. Paul uses two principles in verses 313 to describe the manner in which they are to carry out the command to clothe themselves with love. They are to do so bearing one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. In a church made up of such racial and cultural diversity and grievances, were bound to happen. When they did, the Colossians were told simply to put up 
with one another and forgive as needed. This they are to do just as kathos, K-A-T-H-O-S, the Lord has forgiven you. That is the basis of forgiveness. They extended to each and every one of them was the forgiveness they had received from the Lord. The reconciliation the gospel brings is not merely vertical, but also horizontal. Martin Luther King says forgiveness does more than heal. Forgiveness is love. He also said we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. There is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. MLK, in this challenging political climate, these words resonate so strongly today. Let's not allow to hate and divide us. Let's stand up for each other in the face of bigotry and bullying and deception. Let's shine a light on the positive than rather than drag down by the negative. Let's be beacons of hope that encourage others to shine brightly. And let's remember Dr. King's words. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Thank you, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr for showing us the way. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for showing us the way. May we keep your dream alive now more than ever and always. Forgiveness is a mandate, necessity. So I challenge you today, who is it that you need to forgive? Nike had a slogan years ago, just do it so you can heal. Just do it so you can get better and not stay bitter. Just do it so our eternal, merciful, loving, majestic Lord may forgive you. Just do it so when you see that individual coming down the aisle or walking down the street or in the grocery store at work, you won't have to say, there, here comes such and such. Someone once said, ulcers don't come from what we eat, but what's eating us. Do it because Jesus did it for us. He paid it all. That's right. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Saints, Adam couldn't do it. Abraham couldn't get it right. Moses couldn't get it right. God said, let me come down here and get it right for my people. He came down through 42 generations. Born in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. Did all kinds of miraculous things. Hmm. He was tried in an unjust court. He was accused and beat for nothing in the world. He was bruised for our transgressions. They hung him high and stretched him wide and they pierced him in his side. And he died on a Friday. But thanks to his daddy, his father, Abba, he raised his only begotten sons up with all power. Hallelujah. And he sits on the right hand of his father, interceding for people like you and I. Thank you, Lord. Amen. All to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust
The doors of the church are open. You know, if, if you have a personal banker or a personal doctor, a personal librarian, or a personal shopper, you need a savior. At this time, if your heart is moved and you know you need Jesus and you want him to come into your heart, this is the time. On the bottom of the screen, you can call Antioch and the deacons will inform you on what to do and how to do. There's a number on the bottom of the screen of Antioch. We invite you today. If God says time for you, then it's time for you. Don't wait. It's getting late in the hour. Jesus saves. And he paid it all. Won't you come? God bless you. It's giving time. It's giving time. We'd like to invite you uh, to give. You can give by give a fly. You can mail a check. Or you can donate to Antioch. We have ministries that uh, we have to continue to keep going, like loaves and fishes and community valet service, and different ministries here at Antioch. And we need your support. We would like your support and bless you for your support. You can give by give a fly. You can write a check and mail it to the church. Or you can bring it down to the church and, and, and someone will pick it up. Thank you. God bless you. And may heaven continue to smile upon you. Now it comes to the end of our service. Saints, today and the days to come, if there's someone you have to forgive, ask God to help you to forgive them, that you may be forgiven. And we thank you for tuning in. Now we come to the close of our service. But to him who is able to guard you from stumbling and to set you before his glory without blemish, in exaltation to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, might, and authority before all time. And now unto him, all eternity. Amen. Let us pray. O gracious and majestic eternal God, we thank you. We just thank you, Lord. We thank you for this service today, Lord. Lord, if someone was touched by this service, let them call or come by and say, I want to be a part of this great family, this great church, this great people. Lord, we ask that you bless everyone under the sound of my voice. We pray for those that are sick and shut in that couldn't make it, Lord. We just thank you for everyone that tuned in and one that couldn't tune in. Bless them, Lord, from the crowns of their head to the soles of their feet. Give them strength. Give them strength to forgive. Give them strength to forget. That they may be better and not bitter. And let them heal. But most of all, Lord, let them love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.